Well, welcome to the lab. Um, what I'm going to do today is tell you a bit about our research, the research going on in, in my lab. Um, our interest uh, is uh, in our lab is, the research interest in our lab is at the uh, interface of, let me just get this pin here, uh, at the interface of chemistry and biology. Um, and so um, at, at this interface, and all the projects that we have going on in the lab and the chemistry revolves around that interface. We have had a long-standing interest in drug design and delivery, particularly for anti-cancer and antivirals, um, particularly with the design and method ways of delivering small molecules or designing them such that they will be activated um, in cancer cells or in virally infected cells. Uh, the major focus in this work has also involved biocatalysis, understanding the biochemistry, discovering new biochemistry that can be used for that activation as part of the design, uh, as well as just general rational drug design uh, has been a, also a major focus of our lab. Uh, in addition, um, we have had, a lot, have had an interest over the last several years in, in, new, field, in new fields, particularly um, in nanobiotechnology, uh, uh, which we've been um, one of the leaders in, in terms of our ability to use nanobiotechnology for um, therapies and potential therapies. Um, when we come to our, as a, in, in our lab, um, we have a variety of different techniques that are used. Um, one of the core uh, areas in our lab is organic synthesis. Uh, it's hypothesis driven. We're, we don't do natural product synthesis. Uh, we design molecules that we want to, for hypothesis, hypotheses we want to verify or for functions we would like. We, of course, use medicinal chemistry, being in the medicinal chemistry department, uh, as well as protein chemistry, molecular biology, and all of these different aspects have we, have we used. We've used those. Students who come into the lab will do, don't do all of these things, although in some cases they might. Um, they're particularly ambitious. Uh, but they usually use two, three, or four of these, um, depending on how, um, uh, what their project, what their project, uh, how their project is. Um, goes and what happens in a project. In science, this isn't like a laboratory, uh, an undergraduate laboratory in science. You don't know uh, oftentimes what's the next thing you need to do or what tool you'll need to do. And the tools, particularly at the University of Minnesota, are very good and new tools are coming on all, all the time. And so we want to keep our science at the cutting edge. And so we want to be able to use new tools all the time, particularly new analytical tools to tell us what's going on. Um, so just to sort of bottom line, the students learn in, in my lab to, to attack uh, important biomedical problems by using the power of chemistry, biology, and biophysics. And so we try to, uh, the problem is what we're trying to solve, and we're using chemistry and biology to solve those problems. And students get an intera a, a deep inter, a deep, um, under a, a deep understanding of both those kinds of um, things. So uh, for one of the big aspects of our labs is, 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 my, la is my lab is, is drug targeting and why we want to do that. Uh, why, why would you want to do drug targeting? One of those is to reduce the drug side effects, uh, particularly, for example, for cancer. Uh, and there's also, to a certain extent, antivirals and all, all other drugs. Uh, how can we um, reduce those side effects? Because in some cases, particularly for cancer, the drug side effects are what you're managing, not the cancer. It's actually the side effects of the drugs. So if we can reduce those and we can maybe use, um, uh, make the, the drugs much more effective, more potent, because they can get more of them to the, uh, more of the drug can get to the tissue um, without causing the side effects. It's kind of a little known fact that for most drugs, like for a cancer drug uh, or, or an antiviral drug, that little, as little as 0.01% of the actual drug that's taken actually actually gets to the tumor or actually gets to the, and is taken out by the tumor or tissue. So any way you can increase that should increase your efficacy. Uh, and if you can use targeting, then you can reduce the, the, the sometimes really terrible side effects. Um, the other thing too is just expanding the universe of possible drugs that you could use. You can expand that universe, um, potential entities that would have different properties different solubilities and things that you don't typically use or, or wouldn't be useful be in as um, wouldn't be useful as drugs 
by themselves, but when delivered, they can be used because they then take have the properties in the animal, uh, for example, the distribution, the targeting, and the elimination paths uh, are, are um, more well understood and more manageable um, when they're in uh, when they can be delivered uh, when they can be have undergo targeting delivery. So the kinds of questions we ask for these kind this kind of problem are you know, for targeting. You know how can we how can I get the drug to the right place? What's the molecular way I can do that? We're very molecular, so we're thinking about how we can do this molecularly. Activation: How is the mass drug turned into the active drug or released into the drug into the released into the um, into the cell, and then also uh, tissue activation and elimination. You know where does it go, and how does the body get rid of it eventually? Because you don't want drugs to be there forever; you want them to be eliminated. Uh, and so we've sort of looked at these are kinds of the questions that we ask: whether the, th uh, the therapy is a drug or a, um, a drug or a, a oligonucleotide or a cell-based therapy. So um, our lab is, has developed this um, approach called chemically self-assembled nanostructures. And I'm going to talk today about that part. Um, we have several other projects. Um, there's several others, at least four or five other projects going on, ongoing in the lab. Um, but this may, is a major focus. One of the major focuses of our lab is, is our development of these referred to as chemically self-assembled uh, nanostructures. Um, the, we're using these for targeted cellular therapies, which I'm going to talk about, for targeted drug delivery, which I just talked about. They're used for potential tools to be able to, for us to, um, to analyze and tell whether a tumor is there or how well it's being administered, how well the therapy is working against it. And, and also for uh, biomedical engineer imaging to, to give us a diagnostic of what the, what the, um, uh, of the tumor uh, and its architecture and all. And so, this all project all began uh, with an undergraduate, um, Aaron Cantor, actually, uh, in which uh, we wanted, we were interested in, in finding out and figuring out how we might, several years ago, the question was, you know, can we build small molecules that would bring proteins together and allow us to assemble potential proteins? <clears throat> and one of the proteins that, uh, when looking around, we realized that this protein dehydrophilic reductase uh, this is a crystal structure, and it's bound to the small molecule methyltrexate, which actually is an anti-cancer drug. And we noticed that its tail, end of the tail, it binds with a high affinity. And we noticed its tail is solvent exposed. And we thought, well, this is nice. We have a high affinity ligand, a protein, small protein. Um, if we were to per synthesize dimers of this small pro small molecule, um, referred in this case methyltrexate, referred to as bismethyltrexate, uh, then we might be able to dimerize this protein. And so what we find is, is that in fact we can build those, and in fact they do, um, um, let me just back up here, we can build different types of these. Uh, they have different types of um, uh, linkers uh, that give us different types of um, water solubility and other properties. Well, when we did that, we, um, we added those to the protein. You can see here, here's a crystal structure of one of these bismethyltrexate molecules, and uh, it's, it has dimerized the protein, and that protein, there's actually uh, an induced protein-protein interface between the proteins. This actually works to, um, to stabilize, the, stabilize this interaction, sort of like a, a molecular Velcro, and allows for a very high, very high affinity bi binding between the, two, uh, between the two proteins when they're brought into contact like this. Now that that was good, um, and so what we want to do is could we then utilize if we broke this apart, if we took the two proteins and then fused them together as two fuse, fusion as a fusion protein. So now we have a bivalent protein. If we add then our dimerized dimerizer, this would allow us to potentially assemble these into uh, assemble this uh, assemble them into structures. Um, and when we did this, what we found is that we when we did this, we used the we used proteins which have uh, linkers in which we've uh, incorporated, engineered into the protein, uh, peptide linkers of different size, long linkers, 13 amino acid, down to 7, down to 3, down to a single amino acid. When we dimerized those proteins, or essentially oligomerized them out of the dimerizer, what we found is that we got, um, depending on the linker length, we could get various types of nanorings. And I just have two of those that we um, that uh, we uh, 
I found. One of those is the is what we refer to as the dimer. Usually, if you have a 13 amino acid linker, you get this one. And then an octamer, which has a one amino acid linker. Uh, in this case, we realize that these proteins, uh, uh, we, these proteins were on the size of potentially, based on a lot of analysis, we knew that they were probably, we thought that they were probably rings. And so we took a picture of those using transmission electron microscopy. And you can see here, uh, these are these octameric rings, and you can see a range of these. Uh, they're very fairly homogeneous. You don't see any linear species. And they're true nanoparticles. We can sim we can look at them, we can zero in on one and build in and using our, our um, uh, crystal structure we can build a model that would exactly can um, would exactly represent that structure uh, here at the molecular level and these are on the order of 25 to 30 nanometers in size. So it turns out that uh, when, upon analysis of this we, we realize that um, that when you have a macrocycle, you have a big advantage. One of the, and the big advantage is that they have high stability. The reason for that is when you have a macrocycle that's not covalently assembled, uh, and if they're rigid, which these appear to be, then if they come apart at any point in time, one of those proteins comes apart, um, the ligand is there and it's going to snap shut. There's a high, what's referred to as a high effect of molarity um, that, they, uh, that they can take advantage of. This is, and so as a consequence, you can dilute these down, and we have down to uh, picomolar concentrations, and you still see uh, the majority of the, of the um, nano rings are still fairly, are still entirely intact. Uh, if you have a linear polymer, it, if you think about it, if you had a linear polymer, as you dilute it down, what's going to happen is it's just going to fall apart, and you'll dilute it, and it'll fall apart, and that's what's known. That's from basic uh, polymer theory. So we reason that these could might be useful as potential. Um, uh, as potential scaffolds because they're pretty rigid, uh, they can be self-assembled, and so the idea is is that you would have these little blue guys are 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 uh, let me make this here. So the blue guys are the DHFR here, and you can see here and here they're linked. We'll link that to then uh, if we link that to something that targets get the can target, um, say a cancer cell like a single chain antibody or lipid, then we'd have a targeted, these would be able to be targeted. And then this little squiggly line means what we've been able to do is use a natural amino acid mutagenesis uh, to be able to site specifically put on uh, a polymer like PEG that allows us to make this as, as a protein-based polymer based. And that, that, that's important because what it allow, what, what's known in this design is for proteins or nanoparticles is that if you pegylate them, you'll have a better chance of getting most, uh, a higher, uh, a better chance of getting targeting of um, uh, the protein or nanoparticle to the, to the tumor tissue and avoiding um, the, non the uh, nonspecific uptake of those, uh, of those proteins or nanoparticles. Now, if we add in our, add in our bispecific ligand here as we sort of dumbbells, and then if we added a third arm, we're chemists, so we can synthesize one with a third arm, they would have a, say, for a drug, radio label, or fluorophore. And then we were to mix these, what we would find is they would self-assemble by, what we found is that they could self-assemble into nano rings that would ha be able now to be carriers um, of our, um, carriers of our drug or, or uh, drug uh, or label, um, or anything that we would want. <clears throat> So that would allow us to, what we've been able to do is then, what this does is it allows us to self-assemble them into multivalent, targeted, protein-based, biodegradable uh, nanoparticle, nano, nanoparticles that could be used for a um, variety of different things, including drug delivery. Now, here you see AFM of, of one of those uh, an antibody nanoparticles, uh, the octameric one, and you can see them nicely, just as we see before, having the single-chain antibody on there. Uh, for example, in this case, um, the targeting element doesn't interfere with the ability of the um, protein to form, the ability to form these nano rings. And so um, we also recognize um, that one of the things that we could take advantage of is because we're using DHFR, that, there's a, that there is a drug, trimethoprene, which is FDA approved and it's not a toxic, it's actually an antibiotic drug. Um, and that drug, what, you, what we realize is that if we put an excess of this drug into the solution, that 
uh, when these things come apart, which would be rare, but when they do come apart, uh, that if you could get in there and uh, interfere with the ability to reconnect with each other, uh, then what you would be able to do is disassemble them and you'd have ability, well, you'd, a, a way of pharmacologically disassembling the nanoparticles, releasing the drug in the, in the um, uh, potentially drug or label, allowing, allowing both of these to be eliminated fairly quickly, uh, particularly if they were in vivo. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Particularly if they were in vivo. And so that would allow us to have control over assembly and disassembly of the nano rings, um, and you typically can't you, you do pharmacological control. Uh, and as far as we know, this is really the only way, only method to, to date that's been um, has been invented to to be able to do that. That has a lot of advantages. Um, and here we you can see here here's if we start with uh, our nano particles have been formed nano rings. Um, they, then what we should see is when we add the competitor is disassembly. And you can see here, here's the nano rings here <coughs> that have been formed, in this case a dimeric one. Uh, as we add in more trimethoprim, the, mon the dimer goes away and the monomer uh, goes up. And you can do this with a certain half-life tuned to whatever the concentration of the trimethoprim that you want to do, want to use. So this becomes useful because now we can use, we can tune, we can, we have control, chemical control over what's going on. So one of the things we thought about first doing is, is, is building a molecule in which we have the bismethyltrexate, a linker uh, that would be water-soluble, has this amine here and this PEG linker, then coupled to another linker that allows us to have uh, coupled to a drug, an anti-cancer drug called doxorubicin, <coughs> um, and, they, and it's coupled to the drug uh, by an acid-sensitive linker, which would, if it got into cells, um, and the endosomes would allow it to be cleaved because the in, uh, in cells, uh, the endosomes that, uh, that uh, endosomes are much more acidic, and so you can see cleavage. One of the things we liked about uh, also doxorubicin that's nice is it's fluorescent, so you can track it in the cells. So we could be able to see its uptake in the cells using confocal microsco uh, microscopy, and we could potentially see cell killing if we're getting released. So. The idea, of course, is that you, it would, our nano rings would bind to the cell. They would be incorporated into the cell, into the endosomes, and then release the drug, which would then cause cell death. Target in, and it would only be to a certain uh, cells based on the receptor density, receptors uh, interactions on those cells. So here you see on the um, on the left, you'll see bismethyltrexate doxorubicin. So this is our molecule. Uh, that's non-targeted, it's not in the nano ring, and it does, they do not get taken up into cells. If we now incorporate that, as we, as we, as I said before, into the nano ring, um, in this case, this is a nano ring that targets brain cancer, brain cancer cells. <clears throat> what we find is, is that you see the red, that you can see it's nicely taken up into the cells, into these little punctates, into the cells. The doxorubicin is in the cells. Um, and then if we allow that to go for showing that it can be internalized within the cells specifically. And then if we look at, at the cytotoxicity of those cells, what we find is if we look, the red would be the, uh, a nano, uh, the, um, the red is uh, the um, targeted nanoparticle um, that does not have uh, doxorubicin. And uh, there is a little bit of toxicity from it, uh, but not, not as much as if we have the doxorubicin that's on there. So the cancer, anti-cancer drug here. Uh, this activity here probably comes from some of the methyltrexate. We've observed that you that also gets released and it's an anti-cancer drug, the bismethyltrexate. And so you actually get a combination. It's actually two drugs that are being delivered. But to suffice it to say is that this curve means that we're getting re release of the doxorubicin in the cell. And therefore, um, uh, um, these, thing, these can be used for drug, uh, act, these can, effectively been shown that can be used for drug delivery. Now, uh, one of the things we thought of is how big can we go in terms of delivery? Uh, and so one of the ideas we had was, well, if we take our bismethyltrexate and we add it, add, couple it to an oligonucleotide, say an antisense oligonucleotide, could we build molecules, uh, nanor nano rings that would, if it had targeting element, in this case RGD, um, uh, a targeting element that would, that would, for example, target alpha V beta 3, 
uh, luminal, which is also in cancer cells, we might be able to deliver uh, these oligonucleotides to uh, cells. Um, and this would work uh, by the delivery of the antisense molecule, uh, to the, which would, when it's re if it was released, would bind to the mRNA of the target and allow for um, then, um, um, which would target and degrade the mRNA uh, of a particular protein target, which would then reduce the expression levels of that target. In this case, uh, we've had this long-standing interest in a, in a um, protein target called the FI4E for cancer. We've had a long-standing interest of designing molecules that would that could do this. And Eli Lilly has had a had and ISIS have had a long-standing interest in the development of antisense molecules that would that would actually go after this um, after this target. And so uh, we used uh, their uh, basically antisense molecule. Uh, because it had been validated as a validated molecule, essentially, and coupled this to see if we could get delivery. So if we're seeing a delivery, we should see a loss of expression. And what we see is, these are a number of control experiments, but what we see here is over at the right, what we see is that we can see that we see definite loss of the protein. So this is under normal conditions. This is the amount of protein that we see is way over here on the left. When we've added in our oligonucleotides, our, our nanorings, what we see is a loss of the protein by the Western blot. We see a much, much strong, a much a loss of the amount of protein in the cell, indicating that we've targeted the mRNA and have reduced expression. In addition, it's very similar to just ways people have used to just get uh, the nucleic acids in the cell uh, refer, uh, using a leucophectomy, um, which can't be used in the clinic. But these are ways. These are this is definitely a way that might be useful to. Um, uh, to deliver nucleic acids like DNA as well as RNAs, and those are all things that we're interested in doing. It's, but what we've been able to show is that we can deliver small molecules. Now we can deliver larger, larger uh, molecules as well. So we wanted to see if, at this case, at this point, we wanted we wanted to see, you know, how do these um, respond in animals? How do they work in? How to, and what are their properties in animals? Because everything I've shown you today has to to this point has to do with their ability um, with uh, uh, their essentially activity in test tubes. Um, and so if we take our bismethyltrexate, we if we engineer on to that molecule uh, chelators like DOTA, which we've done, uh, and then if we add copper 64, uh, we can radio label, uh, radio label that, those bis that bismethyltrex, um, the uh, chemical dimerizer. Uh, we can then uh, add our uh, monomers of the targeted um, uh, for the targeted uh, bis by uh, um, DHFR fusion proteins, assemble radio labeled assemble the radio labeled particles, and then uh, if we have in this case we're going to look at brain cancer uh, using the glioma cell line, and then if we grow in a xenograph uh, the cancer cells uh, human cells, um, for example, on the flank of the animal. Uh, on the on the hind limb of the animal, uh, and then inject that into the animal. Then using PET imaging, uh, positron um, emission uh, tomography, uh, tomography um, PET imaging. Um, then what we can see in PET NCT imaging, then what we should be able to see over time is if it's working, we uh, we should be able to see it accumulate in the cell and accumulate in the tumor, and the tumor should light up. We can then go on and also harvest the organs and look to see where the rate of activity is. This would give us an idea about monitoring this, about the half-life in the animals, what their ability, uh, the ability for the, pro to the molecules to stay intact, and how well they are, um, how well they behave in the animals. And so, what we're going to do in this case is, if we, what we would do is first compare the uh, an octamer that's non-targeted that has been pegylated, an octamer that has been targeted. And an octamer that's targeted with also uh, that has been pegylated, and compare uh, those different versions. So we'll get to see what the value of targeting is, and we'll get to see what the value of the peg pegylation is. So here's a, here's an experiment in which at one time point, um, this is about four hours after injection, you can see here with the non-targeted, you don't see any accumulation within the tumor. Uh, if you have targeted targeted nanoparticles, you do start to see accumulation in the tumor. Um, uh, and then if you have, but you see higher accumulations in, also in the liver and the spleen. 
Um, and if you have the pegylated uh, nanoparticles, what you see is lower accumulation in the, in the spleen and the, in the liver, and more accumulation now in the, um, more accumulation in the tumor. Now, if we were to look at uh, time points across how long this acts, so the PEG targeted looks to be the best, that if we measure this out from one hour, four hours, and 24 hours, what we see is that over gradual time, the amount that's that the amount of radio label that's accumulating with time accumulates, uh, accumulates, gets higher and higher as it accumulates within the tumor and the tumor site. Uh, uh, I should point out in this one hour, you see this really high intensity amount that's in the bladder. This comes from uh, the copper 64. Uh, when we, we try to remove all the free copper 64, but you can never quite remove all of it. Um, and so this is a rapid, this is once the injection, you get rapid um, uh, elimination of the uh, excess copper 64. So this means out of 24 hours that these things, that these are, where they are over time, as you can see here, the percent injected dose is going up over time with 24 hours. So the half-life of these is, is, it's in the animals and it's moving around and getting to the target uh, is, is um, uh, at least greater than 24 hours. Um, we can also take a look at, using your PET CT, we can also take a look and see at how these, uh, what they look like, what the tumor architecture is, and you can see that here in the red on the flank is the tumor. We can uh, see what kind of the architecture of that tumor is. It also is clear that it's getting penetrating into the tumor. We can see that uh, relative to that, and, um, uh, and so this gives us an idea of the, where it's going, where it's going in the animal, and also um, uh, where it's going in the animal and the, li and the level of remaining amount that's in the animal. Now, if we look at the amount that's distributed within the uh, within uh, within these mice, uh, again, if, and this is out at 24 hours, and we look to see, um, again, this is for the octameric version. Uh, we can we can then more quantitatively tell we can quantitatively tell how much is um, how much is of the um, radi of the of the uh, of the nanorene has made and targeted the, the tumor. And what we find here is in green is the pegylated version. The non-pegylated version is red, and the non-targeted is in is in is in blue. And you can see here clearly with the tumor that there is a lot more that, um, and this is significant. Um, uh, is this is this is actually quite significant. Uh, there's quite a bit more that that accumulates in the tumor that's pegylated and targeted, than pegylated than just pegylated or not targeted. And there's a lot less, uh, significant less that accumulates within the liver um, uh, and the spleen and the kidneys over time. Um, um, as you can see here. And so this is this gives us a good idea that our strategy is working. We can now design, potentially change that peg, increase this further uh, by playing around with that peg, uh, the, the size of that peg, and, and that should in, uh, decrease the amount of, of uh, nonspecific binding further, as well as increase the amount of tumor of the tumor um, in the tumor. What's really nice is our tumor to blood ratio here is 7.5 to 1, which is, is very nice and shows that we're getting more in the tumor uh, than we're getting in, into the blood, than is remaining in the blood. Now, if we look at the stability, the stability in, the, uh, in, the whole, in, in blood is quite good. Uh, we still see uh, our almost 60% in 24 hours, the CSANS is still intact uh, in blood. And so they're stable in under blood in, the, in blood, and of course, in, in just regular buffer, uh, they have high stability. After 48 hours, you still see 70, um, you still see 70 some percent of uh, uh, of the ring still intact. Um, so they have good stability. Now, one of the things we also thought about doing is could we uh, use this to functionalize nanoparticles? There's a lot of interest in nanoparticles and, and their ability to be used for thermal, um, for thermal targeting in cancer cells, to essentially, and also for using nanoparticles as a diagnostic. And so what we see here <coughs> is we, if we, if we've been able to show that if we take, we figured out conditions in which we can effectively pegylate these nanoparticles, as well as site specifically incorporate then a targeting molecule using our CSANS method. Uh, onto the nanoparticle, in this case, gold. And this, uh, we can see here, this is our Ramon spectrum because you can, you can look at Ramon spectra uh, with gold. Uh, in this case, this is a, uh, nano, this is a nanoparticle that's going to uh, target um, leukemias, T-cell leukemias, 
um, uh, and this is where we have the CD3. And what you find is is that um, again, this um, if you have a Ramon spectrum of the untreated cells, you see this. If you treat the cells there, you see a nice Ramon, Ramon peak, which means that the gold particles are binding to the cells. If we use uh, a really cool technique called uh, Ramon confocal, what we find is that if we have non-targeted um, gold nanoparticles, what we see is there's no accumulation on the surface of the cell or inside the cell. If we use a targeted nanoparticle and uh, incubate at four degrees, what we see is again they're sticking to the cells. They stick to the cell surface. Fine. Uh, fine. They do not accumulate because they don't undergo endocytosis because. They're not undergoing yet uh, endocytosis, which because that's an energy-driven process. So four degrees will shut that down. We heat the cells up to 37 degrees, and now we can see they're internalized really nicely uh, and actually forming some sort of structures within these cells, which we're not quite clear of yet, but we're trying to analyze. But suffice it to say, this is a way for you can also use uh, this approach to uh, target nanoparticles to uh, cells like cancer cells. Now. One of the things we thought about, okay, that's we can use, we can go from small molecules to ligonuclides to whole nanoparticles. Um, what, what about using these for cells? And it occurred to us that if we take a bispecific, if we if we took uh, two um, uh, of these two different DHFRs and we uh, had two different targeting elements on them, two different targeting ligands, that if we mix those, if it's an octamer, that we'd form bispecific ligands that could bind to both uh, both uh, both of those targets and of course at the octamer level about even though it's about eight of these so at the octamer level if it's not it's um, stochastically uh, it's going to be almost a hundred percent it's like 99.9 percent uh, 99.9.5 percent bispecific although stochastically it's going to be some random um, the positions are going to be randomized um, in terms of where they are and the number are, are there uh, and, and we thought, well, what, what we really want to do is if we could use this kind of method, then what we could do is we could cross-link cells, like a tumor cell, with a T cell. And a T cell uh, um, that might go undergo activation and then go after the tumor cell um, and cause cell death, uh, killing the tumor cell. And so our first thing was to take, in this case, these are, tar these are going to target these brain cancer cells. Here we have some brain cancer cells. We add the T cells to them that are non-functionalized without the bispecific uh, ring. And what you see is you don't see any um, binding to the cells. If we add the rings to the bispecific rings, what we see is nicely that the ring that the cells now the red cells are the, the leukemia cells, and the uh, are T cells, and then these big cells are the breast are the leukemia uh, are the are the glioma cells. And you can see they're they're sticking. You see cross-linking of these cells to the to the uh, um, to the uh, gliomas. Now, if we then look to see uh, how well they, if they're being activated, if they're being activated, they should release a, a cytokine called interferon gamma, particularly if they're targeting gliomas. And so what we find is that in the T cells, in this case, uh, human peripheral blood lymphocytes, which have T cells, if we add those with our bispecific ligand, uh, uh, bispecific nano ring, we don't see very, any, very little, if any, activation. But if we add both cells, if we add the target cells in there, the cancer, ce the cancer cells in here, the glioma cells, we add it, we see this big increase in the amount of um, interferon gamma that's, that uh, occurs, innovating that, in, in, indicating that you have, you have to have all three there in order to get um, activation of those T cells. Now, does that lead to cell killing? Well, if we took the non-activated cells, and so if we take the PBNCs and add them to the glioma cells, uh, you do see some cell killing just because it's a, it's uh, the cells recognize the glioma cells as being foreign. But if you add as little as 25 nanomoles of our ring to the material to the um, uh, uh, ring to the to the to the cells, what we find is that we get a big increase in the amount of toxicity to the cells, and they're killing basically killing those uh, glioma cells. Now, as we go in up in increasing concentration, what happens is, is it's, it, you don't see an increase in, in the amount of cell killing. You start to see a gradual drop off. In fact, we see uh, almost a, com a suppression of even below this with just the nano rings, with just the, the PBMCs, just what they typically do. And, and this puzzled us for a while, but then we realized this was actually a good thing because 
it shows us that uh, our mechanism actually is in fact working because at those low concentration, at, as you go up in concentration, uh, what would happen is, is you increase the concentration well above the cell, you know, well uh, to a high enough amount. What happens is, is, is you're going to see um, saturation of both sites on the T cell and on the tumor cells, and therefore they would not be able to crosslink, and therefore it would be blocked. And, and so, therefore, what's happening here is, as you can see here, as we go to even very high concentrations, you see blockade of the interaction that's occurring. And, and what that means is that we actually have immunosuppression here. So this is kind of cool. We can see anti-cancer activity here in terms of cell killing, but then we also see immunosuppression activity up at these higher concentrations. So sort of the duality of this, um, this interact of, of of what we're seeing, uh, leading us to potentially use them for different. Poten there's potentially different things that could be used for. So um, uh, this uh, led us to start thinking about how we might be able. Uh, to use the, uh, to even further go to look at further um, come up with a way that we could uh, design, engineer the surfaces of cells using chemistry. Um, and our, our kind of, our, our um, motivation for this or inspiration was some recent work um, um, by Carl June and others at Memorial Sloan um, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania and also workers at uh, Bryn James at uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, <coughs> in which um, was re they've shown that if you alter the if, if you can um, alter a person's T cells to go after the cancer cells, uh, then you can in fact actually actually you can actually affect a cure. Um, and this girl here, um, this little girl here, Emma was uh, uh, had had um, breast cancer. Had, no, not breast cancer. Had had leukemia. And the leukemia, um, leukemia was became to the point where it was untreatable, and she was essentially going to die. And so what they in, ended up doing is engineering her cells to go after the cancer cells. And in that in that case, she's uh, she has been she was been cured of the of the uh, cured of the cancer. And this we thought the, this is really inspiring. Um, the way that this is done is you have a tumor cell with a tumor antigen, and then the patient's tumor T cells have to be genetically engineered to, to um, pro produce a targeting element like a single chain antibody uh, that would allow it to target t uh, the tumor cell and then, oh, sorry, and then kill, the, uh, kill those, those tumor cells. One of the problems with this approach, one of the problems with the approach um, is that it takes quite a long time to prepare these cells. You have to grow them up. You have to take them from a patient. You have to grow substantial amounts of the, 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 these up. You have to transfect those cells. And, and generally, only, uh, only some percentage of those cells are actually effective. It also means that the patient has a sort of a chronic problem. In the case of the girl, she's cured. Uh, Emma is cured of the cancer. But the, um, uh, the cells have memory, and so you created basically cells that will continuously be genetically engineered cells will be continuously be in the in her body, and what they end up doing is they end up actually uh, um, going after her B cells, and which means that she uh, uh, does isn't able to produce B cells and antibodies, and so she she has to be on a therapy called IGIV right now for the rest of her life. <clears throat> so it, it essentially is an autoimmune disease that she's been given, but that's better than the cancer. So we thought there's a lot of there's a lot of room though for improvement of this kind of approach. Um, so we thought maybe we could mo use our approach to potentially modify cells. So if if we have these uh, two DHFRs here, and then we have a for example this a star is a fluorescent label. If we were able to build a bismethyltrexate with a phospholipid on it, if we those might assemble into nanorings then that would have several phospholipids on them. And that those would allow these rings would then be able to interdigitate in, into integrate into a uh, cell membrane, uh, allowing us to functionalize that cell membrane very simply without using gene, without using gene, uh, uh, without using genetic uh, genetic engineering. So we built a small molecule here. We have a, here's our bismethyltrexate. We have our uh, lit our um, um, a, a, our linker. 
PEG linker, and then it's coupled to uh, phospholipid. And so we built that, and uh, then at, built assembled the, the, the nano rings, and what we and then when we added the LIGO nano rings, what we find is that they do indeed go directly into the lipids. We can actually completely cover them in high concentrations with the uh, nano rings. Uh, but if you back off that concentration, what you can see is they go into specific places in the cells. In the cells, these are we've confirmed are lipid rafts. Most importantly, um, they are also stable on the cells for days, up to three days. And this is important because if we're going to use these in vivo, they need to be stable on the cells. They can't diffuse off the cells. <coughs> we believe the stability is due to the fact that you have many of these phospholipids, several of these phospholipids that will then in interdigitate and integrate into the lipid, into the membrane, and therefore they're not going to come out, and therefore provide high stability. And so, if we now take, uh, if we take our our uh, DHFRs with a, a um, single chain antibody, a targeting ligand, then we create targeting antibodies, targeting nanorings that would be able to integrate uh, into a lipid nanoring and be able to functionalize that, functionalize, in integrate into the cells and be able to functionalize those cells. This would allow us to then, if we had a, if we could functionalize them, allow them to then target directly to, for example, the antigen on another cell. In this case, we're going to use EBCAM, which is on the surface of breast cancer cells, and these are the um, T leukemia cells, which will be functionalized. And we're going to see, can we actually build um, build cell-cell interactions? And so here we have um, uh, the breast cancer cells, which are EBCAM positive. If we add the T leukemia cells, the T cells to this, they wash right off, they don't stick. We functionalize those cells first. What we see is that uh, we see nice, uh, the, the light blue is our our, is our functionalized T cells, T leukemia cells. We find is that they we form now a pro, uh, we found form now cell cell interactions, directing cells to partic particular cell plate cells. In fact, they're along regions of high density of uh, the MCAM. So now we've actually controlled the cell cell interactions. Now remember with our trimethoprim, if we added trimethoprim then to this, we should be able to see be able to see be able to remove them, only have chemical control over their um, their disassembly of those cells. And so here you can see here, here is with no trimethoprim, the T cells stick nicely to the breast cancer cells. We add trimethoprim, they start to peel off really quickly, uh, and you can remove them totally from the cells um, uh, within a few, with, uh, uh, very quickly. And so now what we wanted to do is see if we could, <coughs> if we could actually functionalize, it, uh, functionalize these cells functionalize the cell and do something. So if we have a T, T cell, if we add now our nano rings that can direct it, we could be directed to then a cancer cell and then they, and uh, causing uh, directing cell death to those cells potentially and allow for more you know, cell after cell to be killed by the cancer cell, by the T cell. So here's some live cell imaging I'm gonna show you. And what I'm gonna show you is um, this is, uh, Co these are co-cultures of actually three types of cells. The first one are these red cells. These are glioma cells, and these glioma cells have been stained red. They do not contain, they do not express EBCAM. And these clumps of cells, these smaller cells, are the breast cancer cells, which they do have EBCAM on their surface, and um, they have EBCAM on their surface. Uh, and then these little wiggly guys, these little wiggly uh, guys, these are our T cells, and the T cells are, you can see, are going around sampling the surfaces of each one of the cells. Uh, and you can see cells dividing here. It's, it's, it's actually pretty cool um, if you watch this for a time, long period. But basically the bottom line is nothing happens. That there's nothing really that happens. The cells are pretty much alive and, and they don't really, uh, nothing really happens to the, either set of cells. Now if we go to, um, in, now what we're going to do is again we have these glioma cells which are stained in red and then the, um, which are these big massive cells. Uh, brain cancer cells, and then these these cells like this clump of cells down here at the lower part, lower sort of uh, right, um, are breast cancer cells. And then now we notice that there's a lot more of these T cells that have that are really uh, finding these breast cancer cells. And what we notice that they're they're really spending quite a lot of time on them. And then as you can see, they're di they're collapsing. These cells are are dying essentially. Um, and they undergo uh, apoptosis. If we go up here to this cell up here, this small cell up here is 
it's dividing, it divides, a T cell has found it, another T cell has found it, the two daughter cells uh, is divided, and then they die. You can see them die. Uh, what you find, what you see, this is classic apoptosis and ne necrosis. And what you find is, if you look at these cells, you can see that there's just they become bright. It's the chromatin is being uh, destroyed. And then if you look at their membranes, their membranes are very frothy, indicating that they're uh, that they're being um, the membranes are turning inside out. And then with time, what happens? Boom! Uh, the membrane, the the whole guts of the of the cells just uh, come out, and they're and they're killed. What's interesting is, it, so remember all these cells are dead here, so the breast cancer cells have been killed. The glioma cells essentially are under this, this sort of debris of these cells, and so they are, uh, they're not really touched, uh, they're not touched, uh, and the breast cancer cells are, um, are killed selectively. So uh, if we look at the concentration here, these are um, the T cells, uh, the T cells. We don't need much of the nano rings to add to the T cells. As little as 10 nanomoles, 10 nanomolar concentrations to actually start C cell killing. And then as we add more, uh, we can see pretty much saturation. We've saturated this to T cells, and they can go on and kill uh, kill the, uh, the uh, breast cancer cells. So this is really um, uh, shows that we don't need much to functionalize the cells. It's a non-genetic method. Uh, functionalizes these T cells that could be potentially used as a novel new anti-cancer uh, anti-cancer approach using a patient's own immune cells. So uh, long term, one of our uh, we, we really want to have engineered immune cells is is particularly we're interested in brain cancers, anti-brain cancer types of devices, um, in which, uh, for example, in this brain cancer which is EGF positive. We take T cells, or, and we're also working with collaborators on NK cells, natural killer cells. That if we can functionalize those cells with our with our CSANs, uh, we can uh, with our pegylated CSANs. We can then also we were we're interested, very interested in, in pursuing methods here on campus, uh, working in collaboration um, with um, others on campus, particularly those in the uh, in the MRI facility for uh, labeling these cells with things that could be, uh, for example, with um, iron nanoparticles that would allow us to then uh, to then not only show that we could get cell killing of the T cells to, uh, to, to see cell killing, but also allow us to show where those cells are, to see those cells, um, to see those cells uh, in the, um, where they are, do they get to the tumor, and give us a report back what they're doing, uh, where the, or what the degree of disease is of those cells. And so that's involved quite a few people that we were working with. That's involved quite a few people that we're interested in, in working, that we have collaborations with to, to pursue this sort of whole holistic strategy. Um, so um, so I've shown you we have using these CSANs to use can to design for cancer immune, uh, immune cell therapy. We're extremely excited by this. There's a lot of interest in, in using uh, immune cells for anti as a new ways of using anti-cancer, for anti-cancer therapy. Uh, we're also interested, uh, as I've shown you, we can use this for cancer drug delivery. We also have an interest in, in branching out to bone and heart repair, uh, particularly with our ability to rapidly functionalize, for example, stem cells that could be directed to those repair sites. Um, and that's, a, that's something that's being uh, pursued to now as well. And the other thing is, is using these ways to also using our approaches to, because we can use site-specific labeling, to therapeutically monitor, to monitor what's going on, say, for example, long-term in the patient when they're given these therapies. Can we see the drug go to the, go to the drug or cells, go to the target, and then can we learn what's happening at that target? To better, to, to better, to better manage the therapy, either provide more drug or less drug, um, uh, or to be able to inactivate the drug using our trimethylamine release uh, mechanism. So these are some of the people that I want to acknowledge um, uh, uh, throughout the year, throughout the years that are working in the lab. Um, and I also want to acknowledge we have a great set of collaborators, and also want to uh, acknowledge the funding. So thank you so much uh, for uh, your interest in um, our research. Uh, it's been um, it's this is exciting research. We're extremely excited about what we're doing, and we see a great future. Um, uh, a great future as we sort of design these tool these tools using chemistry, chemistry and biology to provide really synthetic biology based methods for uh, therapies, uh, the therapies um, uh, in uh, therapies of the future.